about that still small voice in verse number 12. But before we get into that, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Elijah, all right? So Elijah pretty much hops on the scene in verse number 17 of 1 Kings, kind of just randomly. You know, he's talking about um, in 16, Ahab assumes the reign of Israel. And the Bible says that it seemed as a light thing to do wickedly before the Lord. I'm going to need to move this down. I feel like I'm super loud right now. Um, Ahab was a king that did very wickedly against the Lord. Now I feel like I'm too quiet. I'm sorry. I'm a mess. He's a wicked king, right? Very, very wicked. One of the, at that, up to that point, the most wicked that Israel had seen, right? And so it's talking about Ahab and then his wife Jezebel, and we know a little bit about them. We know Jezebel is just a very bad woman in the Bible. And then the opening verse for number 17 says, and Elijah the Tishbite. So he just kind of hops on the scene. Elijah was a prophet that God had chosen for this time uh, to be the spiritual influence of Israel at this time. But God didn't choose Elijah to do like happy things. He chose Elijah to do like really hard and difficult, stressful things, <laughs> like just really hard stuff. In the first chapter, Elijah would go to Ahab and he would say, hey, um, I don't know if you know this, but God told me to tell you that there's not going to be rain in Israel for you know, a long time, up until pretty much I say there's going to be rain again. Right. And Israel depended very heavily on the rain to grow their crops. There were seasonal rains and there was a strategy as to how they would grow their crops and stuff. And they said, God, God said to Elijah, no more rain. So Elijah had to go to Ahab, the most wicked king in Israel's history up to that point and say, hey, God said. Right. And Elijah or Ahab didn't really care too much for God. He worshiped Baal and he encouraged Baal worship in the land of Israel. And he was turning the people's hearts away from God and he was doing all sorts of bad stuff. So I couldn't even imagine just going to this king, this wicked king, who's encouraging everyone to worship a false God and say, hey, the God of Israel said no rain. Like that's got to be very difficult to do. But he did it, right? So Elijah, he'll go and he'll tell him that. The next thing he does <clears throat> is he goes into hiding. God sends Elijah into hiding because that made Ahab and Jezebel mad. Of course, they're not going to get rain more. They're like, we need the rain. I can't believe God would do this to us. I mean, you know, we're not worshiping him and we're encouraging worship. Why would he do something so terrible to us? What a mean God, right? And so that's what they're feeling at that time. They're mad at Elijah because Elijah would deliver the message. I'm going to try to slow down for you, Brother Kale. Um, he, uh, he would deliver the message, right? And so God said, Elijah, I'm going to send you into hiding. I want you to go to the river Cherith, which is before Jordan. And you would spend some time in hiding there. And I'm going to bring you food and I'm going to bring you water. I'm going to provide for you. But God's means of providing the food was kind of uh, not exactly what Elijah would have wanted, right? Because he was being provided the food by ravens, right? Now, according to Leviticus chapter number 11, and I believe verse number 25, ravens were unclean birds. They were dirty birds. So you have a dirty bird, a dirty animal, bringing you food that you have to eat and consume, right? So you got this dirty bird bringing you food from its dirty beak and just dropping it in the dirt. And you're like, oh, <laughs> great. Thanks, God. <laughs> and so he's surviving by the river and he's getting the food from the ravens and he's drinking water from a limited source, knowing that this stuff probably is going to run out. And when it does, God says, all right, time to move on to the next thing. All right? And these things are getting increasingly worse. Things are getting increasingly hard, but he's staying faithful. And he's serving, and he's doing what he needs to do for God, and God is, God is taking care of him. He sends him over to Zarephath, right, to move in with a widow woman. Now, Zarephath was a Gentile country. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't uh, familiar to him. So he's in an unfamiliar place. Zarephath was also close to the city where Jezebel was from, right? So now he's in enemy territory, unfamiliar land, enemy territory. And the person that God had chosen to take care of uh, Elijah was a widow woman. Right. And as the in the Bible times back then, widow women, wid widows were some of the most like needy people at the time. They didn't obviously have a husband and there wasn't much they could do for themselves. She was a widow woman. So she had needs as it was. And she had a son. Right. And so God says, go to this widow woman in Zarephath. So he goes and uh, <clears throat> it's a it's a pretty dire situation. There's no food in the land. She's struggling. And she's like, you know, I've only got a little bit of oil in a flask. And I've only got a little bit of stuff to make cakes. And I've only got a couple sticks. And Elijah says, okay, great. Feed me first. And she goes, what? And he's like, feed me first. God said. So then God feeds him first. And then they feed. And then they don't run out of food for a long time. And God provides. And God provides. And they had food, the Bible says, many days. And so pretty good situation, right? God's providing, everything's okay. You know, they're eating cakes every day and they're fed and they're watered and they have what they need. But then in the middle of God's provision, her son dies just somewhat randomly. As you're reading, you'll see like her son just dies, like just dies. Just, the kid just croaks, right? And so it's just super random. And Elijah's probably like, 
oh, and she's like, what did you do, right? She's blaming Elijah at this point. She's like, you know my sin. What did God tell you about me? This is punishment for my sin. And now she's feeling guilt and she's feeling stressed out. And Elijah's like, oh my goodness, what just happened, right? So then Elijah, he's like, you know what? I'm just gonna take the kid. He takes him up to the chamber, lays him out on the bed, stretches himself over the kid, prays over him, crying out to God, like, oh God, would you restore the spirit or the soul to this young boy? And he's praying and praying and praying. And he comes back to life. And then he comes, this verse makes me laugh because he comes back down to the kid and he's like, see, he's fine. Nothing ever happened. Like, he's okay. Like, where's the verse? It says this. Elijah took the child and brought him down into the chamber, into the house, and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, see, thy son liveth. Like, like it was just nothing. Like, hey, he's okay. But super random. <laughs> like, the kid, the kid just dies. God brings him back to life. And I'm sure that was a scare for Elijah, all right? Again, I'm thinking about, look, just hard stuff that Elijah did, but he was faithful, right? And he was faithful, and he continued, and he continued. And so then it was his time for him to go back to Israel, right? He goes back to Israel and he meets up with Obadiah. Obadiah was a godly man that uh, served under Ahab. <coughs> Excuse me. He served under Ahab and, uh, you know, he was just, um, uh, Obadiah did this thing where he would like, he, he basically hid like the prophets of God in the caves, right? And he just, you know, kept them in a safe, in a safe place. He was a man of God. And um, Ahab and Je- Jezebel found out about it. They weren't too happy about that. And so then Elijah finally comes along and he's, I'm sure, like, it's just in my mind, the way that my brain works. Like, he just goes up to uh, Obadiah, and he's like, tell them I'm here. And Obadiah's like, no. Like, are you crazy? They found my, my prophets that I was hiding away. Why would I go and tell them? He was like, did you not, you have no idea that Jezebel has sent for every kingdom in our vicinity to look for you. And Elijah's probably like, oh, well, I didn't know that. Now he does, right? And so he's here. He goes up to Ahab himself, and he challenges Ahab and his prophets of Baal to a competition on Mount Carmel, right? And we know the story. They go up to Mount Carmel, and they uh, build up the altars, and basically Elijah says, you call out to your God, I'll call out to mine. Whoever responds will be the true God of Israel. That will be the one that we're supposed to serve, right? So they have that competition. They build up the, uh, the altars, and the prophets of Baal, they're crying out, nothing's happening, and they're not getting any response. And so they start looking at Elijah's altar, and they get mad at Elijah, and they tear down his altar, right? Elijah goes, oh, you know, it's my turn. I knew that was going to happen. I knew that nothing was going to go on with your altar. I knew nothing was going to happen with Baal, so let's just do mine. He rebuilds the altar. He puts the sacrifice on it. He builds a moat around the sacrifice, fills it with water, and then dumps water on it three times, like just douses it with water. And then he goes, just watch what I'm going to do. He makes a prayer to God. God sends down fire from heaven, burns up the sacrifice. It could this completely soaked sacrifice, burned up the sacrifice, burned up the water, burned up the, the, the wood that was on the altar. And it was a done deal. All the prophets of Baal were like, oh, man, he really is the God of Israel. And then they all died, right? They all got killed. And so <clears throat> Elijah does this amazing thing, being faithful, seeing the goodness of God, responding to his prayer, right? Like, this is a good thing. And so he goes back down. God sends back the rain. And Jezebel, again, <clears throat> Jezebel again causes him to flee. She goes, you know what? He killed my prophets. I'm going to kill Elijah. And Elijah goes, oh, man. And so he gets afraid and he goes on a run. He goes for the run, right? He runs for Beersheba. He finds a juniper tree and he rests under the juniper tree. And the Bible says this in verse number uh, <clears throat> five, four, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. He did all those things, right? He did all those hard things for God. And he was serving him with the right spirit and he was faithful. He did what he was supposed to do. But then he gets burnout. He burns out. He gets tired, right? He gets uh, just a little bit down on himself. He's like, I'm tired of the persecution and I'm tired of the brokenness and I'm tired of unclean animals and I'm tired of people wanting to kill me for just doing the right thing. So God, as I lay under this juniper tree, just kill me. I've had enough. He's burnt out. He's tired frustrated. I'm probably uh, uh, hurt or angry or whatever it may be, disappointed at what's going on. But God says, uh, the angel of the Lord comes to him. And if you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, you can just assume that that's Jesus. I'll let Brother Andrew teach you guys about that one Sunday morning. But he ministers to him. He says, Elijah, you're going to be fine. Just need a little sleep, some food, some water. Amen. Right? He says, just take a little nap. You'll be okay. Have some food. Take a nap again, wake up, have more food. I'll give, you, I'll give you strength for the journey, right? So he does that, <clears throat> and he gets strength 
for the journey, enough to travel for 40 days. And so God gives him the strength. He travels up to Mount Horeb. And the Bible says this in verse number 9 of verse, uh, chapter number 19, and this is where we're going to be. He came hither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? So Elijah makes his way into a cave. God gives him the strength to travel. And Elijah, after just a long, hard, faithful ministry, being a good servant of God, is burnt out. He makes his residence in a cave. He just, you know, stays there for a little bit, just to, just to ease the burnout a little bit if he could. And I'm sure at this time, like I said, he's hurting and he's, he's messed up and he's broken and he just wants a little bit of a break. And God comes to him, and I don't think this is a spirit of uh, retribution, not retribution, a spirit of uh, reproval or a spirit of, you know, chastisement. But he just says, Elijah, what's wrong? What are you doing? What's going on right now? Why are you, you know, sulking in this cave right now? Are you good? And Elijah, Elijah just spills, right? In verse number 10, he starts going off. He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah makes his complaint. He makes his statement. He's very, he's very pressed about this. He says this, I have been very jealous. That word in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary means, uh, uh, means concern for the honor of, right? And so Elijah's saying like, look, I've been trying to hold up your name and I've been trying to honor your name. Nobody seems to care. They're throwing down your altars and they're not honoring your covenant and nobody's doing it. Does anybody care? I'm the only one doing right. Hey, I'm the only one going through what I'm going through right now. There's not a single person in Israel that wants to live for you. What are we doing right now? Right? Frustrated. That's emotion. And he's in this time, he's, you know, coming off as self-centered and he's giving himself a little pity and he's, he's broken. He's saying, God, I, even only I, myself, I'm the only one doing this stuff. What's going on? Like, do you even know? And so God looks at him <clears throat> gives a simple response. He says this, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. He says, Elijah, why don't you just come outside? I want to show you something, all right? Now, the Bible doesn't say that Elijah gets up. I believe that Elijah really just stood in his spot, right? Sulking, emotional, uh, uh, angry, frustrated, sad, whatever it is that he was feeling, whatever it is that he was feeling for that burnout, those emotions, he just stood there and he just sat in them. He just said, you know what, whatever, I'm just going to let this fester for a little bit, right? And so God goes out of the cave and he starts doing all these crazy works, right? He starts doing all this incredible stuff that you couldn't even imagine happening back to back. There was a wind that came that was so great that it split the rocks on the mountain, but God was not in that storm. Then there was an earthquake and the ground was shaking and I'm sure the ground was splitting and rocks were falling and all sorts of different stuff, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And then fire, right? Randomly, just a burning vehement fire, but God wasn't in the fire. Why wasn't Elijah responding to those things? Why wasn't Elijah responding to the wind? Why wasn't Elijah responding to the, to the earthquake? Why wasn't Elijah responding to the fire? Because that stuff was not what he needed to see or hear. You know what it was that he needed? It was the still, small voice of God that he needed in all his trouble and all his trial and all his persecuting and everything that he experienced, the still, small voice of God is what he needed. There are many ways to apply that verse right there that talks about the wind. He could be saying, you know, God could have been trying to show Elijah, like, Elijah, look, my, your life isn't always going to be uh, uh, incredible things. You called down fire from heaven, and, I mean, you, you shook up the, the royal family in Israel, and you, you made, you know, ruffled some feathers, did some things. You did some good stuff for me, but it's not always going to be great. It's not always going to be fantastic. I'm not always going to be giving you the pomp and circumstance, and I'm not always going to be giving you all the spectacular things that you expect me to give you. Sometimes you just need to slow down and spend time with me. You don't need the big stuff. You don't need the, you don't need the wind to blow you away, and you don't need something to shake your life up, and you don't need that, that, that burning fire of passion, whatever it is that you think you need. You don't always need that stuff. You just need my still, small voice to spend time with me, to listen for me, to, to fellowship with me. Sometimes you just need to slow down. It was that voice that moved Elijah. And can I say to you that what we need in our Christian life is not acts of grandeur. 
All right, we don't need that thing that sometimes that's just going to completely blow us away or that thing that's going to shake up our life or that thing that's going to give us that, that feeling that we get at revival when somebody comes through, Mark Stroud comes through, preaches a great message. You're like, man, that was good. I'm fired up. And then it burns out. You don't always need that stuff. Sometimes you just need to have a small voice that says, hey, what's going on? What are we going to do about this? Hey, listen to me because I'm talking. Do you want to hear? Right? The still small voice of God speaking to Elijah. Elijah was burnt out, right? He was burnt out in the cave. And I, sir, he was feeling very emotional, broken, frustrated, bothered. Uh, I mean, X, Y, Z, everything that you can name it, like anxiety, depression, whatever it is that you can check the list, right? And he was all of it, I'm sure. And we can get that way too. Yeah. Hey, look, in all, our, in all our serving and in all our walking and in all our being a Christian, we get burnout. And it's a regular part of life. It happens, Right? You get tired and you get, you know, frustrated. You get anxiety and you get depression. Hey, I've had, you know, we've all had it all. We've all been in different spots of life. And I was thinking about this. God showed me this a while ago. And I thought, man, this is really good because, like, you know, when you get burnt out, how do you handle it? How do we handle the burnout in our lives? I don't, I really don't have a problem with what Elijah did because sometimes you just need to kind of chill. But the way he did it was wrong. But we do it that same way sometimes. When God says, hey, what's the matter? You go, mm. He goes, Suleiman, what's wrong? I'm the only one, God. Everyone hates me. and You don't even know what's going on. Right? But God knows. He knows. And we can't do that. Hey, listen to me. When you, when you get that burnout and when you, when you start to feel whatever it is that you feel, you cannot live in that state of mind. You cannot live in that place. And I understand different circumstances in life, you know, have you go in different directions. I understand you can't always change your circumstance, but you can change your mindset. Now, Brother Jesse, are you, are you a positive thinker? Yes. I'm not, I'm not a positive thinker. I'm a Bible thinker. I like to think about what the Bible says. Right. Think about the truth, right? That's what it's all about. You can't just, you know, fill your mind with fluff and say, well, it's okay. I'm not really sad. You are sad. It's okay to be sad. It's fine. God made us that way to feel that way. But you got to be able to think biblically, right? So I just want to share with you guys, like Brother Andrew all said tonight, some promises that you can claim when you're feeling burnt out, things that you can do in that burnout, all right? And I'm going to try to get through these as quick as I can, <clears throat> but I don't want to rush the Holy Spirit here. The Bible says this, all right, you can't stay there because it's not good for you mentally and emotionally, like I said. To live in your burnout is not good for you mentally and emotionally. So the more time he spent, the more he got in his head. And the more he got in his head, the more those feelings increased, I'm sure. And look, I've had moments like that too. My moments come when I'm trying to sleep. And y'all know how much I love to sleep. Right? So when it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm in my burnout, and I'm like, God, what in the world? And I start thinking, and I'm not really praying, and I'm not really trusting and believing. And I start to think more. I get in my head. And the more I get in my head, the more that I start to focus on those emotions. And the more that I focus on those emotions, listen, the less I trust. The less I trust, the less I believe. The less I believe, I'm useless. I can't do anything for God that way. You got to get out of your head. You can't stay in that spot because it'll cause those feelings, those emotions to grow. That's where strong anxiety becomes even stronger. And that's where depression comes along. And then you really can't do anything. I don't, I don't think depression is a, is a sin at all. I'm not one of those that think, you can't be depressed. You're saved. You can be depressed, right? Depression is paralyzing. Depression will stop you from doing what it is that you need to do. But there's an answer for all of it. It's to seek the voice of God. To seek God. Burnout and feelings cannot stop us from seeking God. If we don't seek God, then we won't believe. And it's when we stop believing, that's when it becomes sin. When you stop believing that God will take the sin of unbelief, when your anxiety causes you to not believe that God can do it, that's when it's sin. When your depression takes your belief away, that's when it becomes a problem. Because now that, that problem is much bigger than God in your life. And that's not the way that we were, that's not what we were saved for. That's not what it's supposed to be like. You got to remember verses like Ephesians 4, 4 15 and 16, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And uh, 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we, may find, that we may obtain mercy 
and find grace and help in a time of need, right? Listen, regardless of how you feel, regardless of your brokenness and your depression and whatever it is that you may be feeling, you have a high priest that understands exactly how you felt. Hey, listen, listen, think about the Garden of Gethsemane when he was getting ready to be crucified. What do he say? Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Jesus was praying in that moment, full of heartache, full of brokenness, full of anxiety. And I'm sure like, why, why do I have to die? God, if it's your will, then just let pass it on. I don't want to drink this cup. I don't want to, I don't want to do this job, but it wasn't the father's will. He did it anyway. The man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He understands. God knows because he's felt it before. We got to remember that Jesus in his earthly ministry was a man, hundred percent God, 100% man. We got to understand that God knows how we feel. And we can't just get like Elijah, the I, even only I. It's not just about you. It's not. It's about you and God. And you have to continue walking with him and continue to seek his voice. There are songs in the hymnal that I despise singing because they're so depressing because it's all about me. And it's all about I. And it's all about this. And it's all about life is so drab. But, you know, there's God. That's terrible. Like, what kind of, why, why would you talk about your problem before you talk about God first? Why? You know what I mean? Why is that such a huge factor in your life? It's because we get stuck on our problems. We live in our problems. We, get, uh, uh, we start to live in that space, that burnout. We can't live there because it messes with your mind, messes with your heart, messes with your spirituality. Okay? So you can't stay there because mentally it's not good for you. Emotionally, spiritually, it's not good for you. You can't stay there <clears throat> because the devil is not going to put his plans on pause for you to recuperate. He's not. The devil's not just going to stop waiting for you to like, oh, man, I'm just going to wait. He ain't going to wait. He doesn't care. He's going to keep coming. He's going to keep doing what he needs to do. He's going to keep on fighting that battle as soon as you can. As soon as you're able, get in the fight and trust that God is going to give you the strength to fight. The devil's not going to quit. Listen to me. Jezebel didn't call for the death of Elijah the second time because she thought he was tired. She didn't like, oh, he's tired. Let me give him a break. She didn't care. She said, kill Elijah. She knew that he was tired. He had a, he had a long day on top of Mount Carmel. And he was like, God, this is taking immense faith. And, and he's praying. And as we all know, prayer is work. And it's hard stuff, labor and prayer. And he was laboring. And there was humiliating stuff going on up there. They were demeaning him. And they destroyed his, his altar. And he had to rebuild it. And I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on. So I'm sure he was tired from that. And Jezebel said, kill him. And he was like, oh, man, now I really got to go. Because she actually doesn't care. The devil's the same way. First Peter 5.8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Regardless of your feelings, regardless of your burnout, regardless of what it is that you feel, the devil is actively seeking to destroy you, to devour you. Hey, look, the devil wants your heart. The devil wants your joy. The devil wants your peace. The devil wants your sense of security in Christ. The devil wants all of that. And you know what? If you're not careful, if you're living in your burnout, if you're living in your brokenness, if you're living in your feelings, then he'll take it away. He'll rip it right away from you. And listen, it is so hard to get it back. It's hard to get it back. But here are some promises that you can claim from the Bible. Listen, when the devil is coming for your peace, You've got Colossians chapter number three. Colossians chapter number three is probably one of my, probably my favorite chapter in all the Bible. Colossians chapter number three. I got the whole thing highlighted because it's just so good. Colossians three. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which you are also called in one body and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Put on therefore as the elect of God. Hey, this is, this is the chapter that talks about putting off the old man putting off that life of darkness, putting off that life of sin, whatever it is that God took from you when you got saved, he gave you something new. The Bible talks about putting that on, wearing that as a Christian. Colossians chapter number three, that's one that you can remember when you need peace. What about Philippians four, chapter number six, or four uh, verses six through seven? Four, six through seven. <clears throat> Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace, when the devil wants your peace, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, Think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. With promise, 
If you can just think on these things, if you can think on spiritual principles and you can think godly and you can think about like, man, God wants to be with me. God promised me that he will be with you. Then he will be with you. The God of peace. And that is a peace that no man can take away. Not even the devil himself. What about when the devil wants your joy? James 1, 2, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. When the devil wants your heart, you've got John 14, number one. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus talking about believing in him. 1 John 3, verses 19 through 21, talking about, uh, talking about the, uh, when our hearts condemn us. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence. Listen to me, when you're in a moment and you're thinking like, you know, when the devil's coming after your heart and he's pulling away your attention from God and your love for God, is it the same? You just got to think like what? You know, my heart right now is, is all messed up. I mean, my heart's in a hundred different places. God is greater than your heart. And he's able to take all the broken pieces of your heart, piece it back together, and you can have confidence in him. And your heart won't condemn you anymore. Look, these are just simple Bible verses that we can claim, good ones that you can claim. When you need strength, you got 1 John chapter number 2, verse 14. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the evil one. It says young men, but young men, young women, old men, old women, kids, daughters, whatever it may be. Listen, ye have the word of, the word of God abideth in you, lives in you. Right? You know what that means? Right here. There's not a far distance from your heart to your mind. Literally, what? How many inches is that, Harrison? Twelve? Like a foot? Your heart, your mind is a foot away from your heart. Listen, here's what I'm, here's what I'm saying. Listen. The word of God abideth in you, lives in you, on the inside. Look, if you'll commit it to memory, if you'll remember it, if you'll spend time in it, abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. But God already says, look, you're, you've already overcome the wicked one. Maybe not in this battle. Maybe not in this trial. But in the long run, in the long scheme of things, look, we already win in the end. At the end of the book, God says we win. So you can take comfort in that. And you can find peace in that. And you can find joy in that. Life's not going to be easy. I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel where everything's going to be okay. There are times in life where nothing is going to be okay. But ye have overcome the wicked one. If the word of God abideth in you. I mean, that's good stuff. Great stuff. You can't stay there because the devil isn't going to stop for you. You can't stay there because you'll never get your eyes off the problem and back on God if you don't just seek the voice of God. You know, we have a type of Christianity today where all people can seem to talk about is the storms of their life. It's all they talk about. And that is terrible. That's terrible. And I'm not condemning, I'm not talking down on storms, and I'm not talking down on hardships in life. I get it. There's stuff that some of us in this room have been through that I couldn't even imagine. But for that to be the only thing that you talk about, that's embarrassing. Because there's no belief in that. There's no faith in God in that. There's no, like, I'm, it's, those, it's like the type of Christians that when we're having a name of blessing that you got this week testimony service, and they start talking about nothing but trouble, that's what I'm talking about. Look, there's a lady at my church that I went to uh, when we lived in Florida, and every time we had a testimony service, at least 30 minutes, just griping and just, well, woke up this morning, my air conditioner didn't work, and we're like, aw, yeah, so then God, so then, you know, God sent these guys to my house. I'm like, okay, cool, yeah, but they wanted to charge me $1,200 to fix it, aw, but thankfully, praise God, I had the money in my bank account. Great. But now my bank account's in the negative. Aww. <laughs> and it's like, when do, when do we get happy? <laughs> when, when do we get happy? I'm kidding you. Not. It's a real story. She had the microphone for the 30 minutes. It's a New Year's Eve service. It's 12 o'clock in the morning. We're past the new year. She's talking about her air conditioner, just griping. And somebody's like, get the microphone from my GT. She's done. Right. And so, look, but that's what I'm talking about. People that only all they know how to do is complain. But listen, at the end of their at the end of their gripe, at the end of their testimony. Right. 
They start talking about, oh, I'm, I'm going through a storm right now, and man, life is just terrible, and, and this right here is bad, and this right here is bad, and X, Y, Z. But I believe God. No, you don't. No, you don't. And that may sound harsh, but it's true. Because, you know, I've been that. I've been that, where I've got hard stuff in my life, and I'm just complaining and complaining and complaining. and say, oh, but I believe God. You know, he's going to take care of it. You don't really. I, I didn't really think that. There was no faith behind that statement. I had no, no Bible for that statement in my mind. I wasn't thinking a single spiritual thought when I said that. I said it just because I'm trained to think that way. God's going to fix it. Right? When we're talking about storms, like that can't be the, the, the biggest things in your life. Sometimes I understand you just have to get it out. There's a time and a place, and there's you know, a proper way to do it. But for it to be the only thing that we talk about, for us to be complaining all the time and then just blanket it with, I believe God, that's, that's nothing. That is such a weak Christianity. Because if that's the only thing you talk about, then, you know, like, do you even know what more you have going for you? Do you even know what all the Bible says? This is stuff that I have to ask myself, stuff that God has to remind me. Look, listen, let me show you something right here. When you're thinking about storms and troubles in your life, and you think, well, what do I possibly have going for you? You have 31,102 things in this Bible going for you. Right there. What's that number that you just gave us? Verses. Stuff that we can use. Stuff that we can learn from. Verses that I, that I gave you just now. Verses that you have in your mind and in your heart. Stuff that's personal to you. Think about that stuff instead of the trouble and trials in your life. Instead of keeping your eyes fixated on the issue that's causing you whatever sort of discomfort. Listen to me. God didn't save us for our prosperity. God didn't save us for our comfort. Our, our hope is not a paycheck. Our hope, is not, uh, our hope is not for this person to stop being so aggravating in our life. Our hope is not the monetary things of his life. Our hope is the rapture. Our hope is Jesus Christ. Listen to me. When you got saved, you understand that salvation was for God to completely change your mind, change your life, not in the ways, always in monetary ways. I'm not saying that you getting saved is mean you're going to have a Fortune 500 company someday in your name or you're going to have whatever it is that you're going to have. You may not have those things. But the comfort comes from having Christ. Yeah. The comfort comes from having him in your life and in your mind and in your heart, the word of God abiding in your heart and the things that we've talked about so far. That's not the comfort. You think, God, I, I'm tired of being persecuted. Welcome to Christianity. That's what persecution, that's what it's all about. We're going to be persecuted. God spoke to, to the disciples and he told them like, hey, look, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. It's going to be hard, but you have me. You have me. And that's what it's all about. Thinking about the storm, right? Here's two verses that you can think of as to why the storm shouldn't really be a major factor in your life. Psalm 97, 93, Psalm 93, verses 3 and 4. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice, and the floods lift up their waves. You're in a storm, and you're thinking, God, the, the waves are getting higher, and, the, and the, 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 the struggles of life are flooding my life. Look at verse number 4. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. The Lord, number one, that is above the storm, is mightier than the storm. Right? How can we let the storms of our life and the troubles and trials of our life overcome how we see God and how we walk with God when God is the one that created the water? God is the one that, in, in, in verse number 11, or verse number 11 of 19, he's the one that caused the wind, and he's the one that caused the earthquake, and he's the one that caused all the turmoil. He's the one that created all that. You don't think he has that in his control? How could it be that the storm is the biggest thing in our life? How could it be that the storm is not about God in the storm? It's about you and God. And the storm, it's going on around you. It's going on whatever. Like, and it's, you know, it may affect your path and it may affect whatever, but that's not about, it's not just like, oh, God's going to handle my storm. So I don't really need to think too much about it. You do need to think about it. You don't need to think about the storm. You need to think about him. And you need to walk with him and spend time with him. It shouldn't be the primary factor in your life. Psalm 40, verse number 17, another verse that I love, a great verse in the Bible. The Bible says this, <clears throat> David said this, I am poor and needy. Yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O oh my God. When you get to those I, even I only type moments, think about this verse, 40 verse 7. Yet the Lord thinketh upon me. God's thinking about you. Think about that. Out of however many people in this room, maybe 50, 60, 70 people in this room, God is thinking about each and every one of us and what we're going through. He knows. He understands. And this is a verse that you can find great comfort in. 
Man, and, and even just outside the Bible, there's plenty more to be thankful about in our lives. I mean, you know, we, we, we have a church <laughs> that we're in. And I mean, we've got, this, we've got this beautiful stage and we've got a grand piano, an electric piano right here. We've got these comfy chairs that are fun to sit in. I like them. We've got these, you know, nice microphones and we've got these microphones up here. We've got these handful of microphones, big old TVs, two in the front, one in the back. We've got chairs that you can sit on that are nice and comfortable. We've got Bibles and hymnals in every chair. And this is where the Word of God is preached. We literally preach on the Word of God. I'm sure there's a Bible dug under here, right? Literally preach on the Bible. It's a place where you can come and fellowship and let the music minister to your heart. And, I mean, there's so much going on in here and so much more out there as well. Your home and your family and just the things that you have. I mean, the stuff that God sustains, the stuff that you live for. It's all God. And God is so good that he would sustain us and that he would take care of us. Even when we don't believe, even when we're in the cave and when we're sulking and we're like, God, you have no idea. God does have an idea. And he's still working it out for you, still sustaining you, still keeping you above the water. When the disciples were in the storm with Jesus, they cried out, Master, seest thou not that we perish? Right? The storm was coming, and, and at the time, it was like the storm was so, so heavy and so vehement that the waters were like pouring into the boat, and they were stressing out. Jesus was in the hole of the ship sleeping. They're like, God, see it, Master, seest thou not that we perish? They were in a literal storm, and they went to the right place, but I don't think their minds and their hearts were in the right spot because their focus was on the problem. Their focus was on the storm, like, God, just, just get us out of this situation. Get me out of this spot. So Jesus obliges, he comes up, he says, peace be still, and the statement that he makes after this blows me away. He says, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have not faith? He goes, what in the world are you afraid of? How could it be that you don't believe? How could it be that you have no faith that I'm going to handle this for you? God doesn't understand faithlessness. God doesn't understand unbelief because he is the God of all creation, the God of all time, the God that, uh, like I said, mentioned, the God that puts you in the storm, or maybe you put yourself in that storm. He's the one that created the water. He's the one that created the materials to craft the boat. He's the one that's giving you the life. He's the one that's giving you the brain that's worrying about it, the emotions that's worrying about it. He's the one that put all the pieces in place. How is it that you can't believe that God is going to fix your life? I'm talking to me because I'm a worrier. I worry a lot about a, diff- a lot of different things. I'm, you know, not constantly, but I have, I get concerned and I start to overthink and I start to, that's when I get in my head and I'm in the cave and I'm sulking and God's like, hey, watch this. And I'm like, no, I don't want to watch it. I'm mad right now. You don't even care. I'm like that too. But we got to have faith. We got to have faith through it all. Man, God has to remind me of these, these things often. Man, number one, if nothing else, I mean, you're saved. God saved your soul from an eternal hell where you were going to perish far greater than any perishing that you experience in this life. Far greater. I remember a couple months ago going through uh, discipleship with, with, uh, with Mark. And we were going over some of the salvation stuff. And it was just simple stuff. But man, it was getting good over there. It was great. Because you start thinking about the fact that before you got saved, there was no possible way for you to have ever known God. There was no bridge to gap that distance. But then you heard about God, and you heard about Him, and you accepted Him into your heart and into your life. And you know what? All of a sudden, there's a way. You have a straight path to the Savior. Think about uh, Ephesians chapter number 2. It's a great chapter in the Bible. Ephesians chapter number 2. The Bible says this. And you hath he quickened. That word doesn't mean made faster. You ever think about little kids when they get a new pair of shoes and they're like, I'm faster than everybody now because I got new shoes, right? That's not what this Bible verse is talking about. Quickened. He hath given you life who were dead in trespasses and sins. Spiritual, spiritually dead in the trespasses and sins of this life. And God has given you new life from that deadness. Where in time past ye walked, walked past tense according to the course of this world, the path that this world has set, you were walking it not even knowing. You didn't even know there was another option but to live for the world. But now you know. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, doing whatever it was that we felt like our body needed, chasing whatever career, chasing whatever uh, pleasures, chasing whatever it may have been in your life. We had no idea. 
and God gave us new life, and you are renewed in knowledge. But God, hey, <laughs> look at that. And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others, by nature, naturally the children of wrath, the children of anger. Were you ever angry before you got saved? Lived an angry life? Just live bothered all the time? You don't have to do that anymore. Because why? What does the next verse say? It says this, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, who is rich in mercy, he's so rich in mercy that he just gives it. Even when, you do, even when you weren't saved, God gave you mercy in your life. And he still gives it today. Wherewith his great love, he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace are ye saved. Getting what you don't deserve. You didn't deserve salvation. You don't deserve God. But God wanted you. He wanted you. I mean, think about that. How, how, how special is that? You know, you ought not to get used to your salvation. I ought not to get used to my salvation because sometimes I do. And I think, man, God, I deserve it. I deserve to be the song leader, and I deserve to preach because I'm, I'm special. I don't know how to sing, and I don't know how to preach. God puts this stuff together for me. I'm not, I'm not so smart. You guys should see me in school. I just exposed myself, but that's okay. <laughs> Listen, I'm not a great you know, learner, and I'm not the smartest person in all the world. God puts all this stuff together for me. I don't deserve a single one. I don't deserve a single thing in my life that I have. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they were like, you know, it's, it's amazing that, that you know, that you get to song lead and that you get to preach and that you get to be involved in the church and you're in a good growing church and you've got people around you and, and you know, you, you, you know the, you're, there's just such great stuff. And I was like, you know, it's the joy of my life. There's nothing else that I would rather. I was thinking about it the other day. I'm getting ready to graduate college and I'm like, I need to find a way to make money <laughs> because I do like moving jobs and stuff like that, but it's not consistent. It dies out in the, and when it gets colder and whatever. So I'm like, I need a more sustainable way to make money. But I like, I can't think of a single thing. If I can do this, for free for the rest of my life, I don't want to get paid because I love it. I love this with all my heart. And it's nothing about me that deserves to do something that I love so much. Nothing. I don't deserve to be in this spot. I don't even deserve to be out in the pulpit or, or in the pews. There's nothing about me that deserves the life that God gives, and yet he gives it anyway, freely, in abundance. And how good is that? And it all starts with salvation. There's more right here. Look, you've got the Holy Spirit on the inside. The Holy Spirit's not far away. He's here, right here with you. He's with you. And, you know, he's like, he's like Jiminy Cricket, but so much better. Like, I mean, he tells you what to do and where to go and what not to say and what not to this. And sometimes, you know, he gives that conviction and you go, God, oh, I don't want to. Why are you convicting me right now? But it's worth it because when you obey it, God blesses that obedience. And you go, oh, well, that's why we obey. And then you do it more and you do it more and you do it more. And then, you know, God just takes care of you and he works out all the pieces together. You've got a guide. You've got something that leads you, something that, you know, without you, you're just walking around aimlessly. You've got the Holy Spirit on the inside. You got the imputed righteousness of Christ. What is imputed? It means given. When you got saved, God gave you the righteousness of his son. And now when he looks at you, he doesn't see that child of disobedience, that child of wrath. He sees his son in you. How special is that? That God sees his very own son, his perfect son, that he sent to earth to live and die, to live without sin, to live a perfect lifestyle, a perfect savior, a perfect sacrifice. And when he looks at you, he sees him. That is amazing. He's given you a purpose. And some of us, you know, some of us are young. You may not know what that is. You may, you know, whatever it may be, whatever your purpose is in life, God has given it to you. And that's special. He's given you the very word of God. He's given you fellowship with him. He's given you godly music. Listen to me. I'm, I'm just saying, and I'm about to be done in just a minute, but God is good. Amen. God is so good. I'm not, I'm not downplaying storms. I'm not downplaying trouble. I'm not downplaying heartache. All that stuff is very real. But where your problems in life should be, Christ should be way up here. So much so that you're up here with him, and it's so low down that you can't even see it. You know what I mean? And, and I'm not talking about delusion. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about shirking off whatever it is that you feel, whatever. I understand that's necessary. Sometimes you have to accept how you feel, but life isn't about feelings. And it sounds kind of robotic and it sounds, you know, maybe a little bit heartless or whatever, but fact over feeling. Fact over feeling. What do we know is fact? God's word. This is truth. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. God sanctifies you by the truth of this word. God is good. And I, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't help but just extol his name. Look, that's what the psalm says right here. Uh, psalms number, 
Psalms number 30, I will extol thee. Extol means to make high, to give the highest form of praise. I will give you the highest form of praise. Regardless of what I'm going through in my life, regardless of what I'm feeling, I will give you the highest form of praise because you're worthy of it. Man, no matter what we face, life is good because God is good. Pastor preached it this morning, uh, uh, Psalms chapter number 23. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but man, that's a good chapter. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not have need. I shall not lack. I remember reading that verse as a kid and thinking like, if I'm a sheep, I'm just like a dumb little sheep, wandering around, bumping around in the woods, have no idea what's going on, and God is my shepherd, then why would I not want him? (laughs) I was like, why would I not want him? But then I learned it means you should not lack. And I'm like, oh, I'm glad I'm a sheep and he's a shepherd. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Hey, look, on the topic of storms, when waters are rough, when it's tossing your ship to and fro, the Bible says this, he leadeth me beside still waters. Calm, quiet, peace be still type waters. That's where he leads you. He restoreth my soul. You know, we've learned over the years that the TH at the end of the words means in, uh, in a continual motion. Constantly restoring your mind, will, and emotions, constantly, never stopping, never failing, constantly restoring. Leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. He shows us how to live. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for what? For thou art with me. In the troubles of life, in the valley of death, when the, when the shadow of death creeps over you and it makes you shudder and you don't know what to do, God is with you. And in God's presence is the absolute absence of fear. God is good. He's with you through it all. He knows. He cares. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. And pastor, he, he taught about it this morning, and I can't remember what exactly he said, but the way that I like to apply it is just imagine like you got a cup in your hand, right? And God goes, you want some grace? Sure. How much? Half a cup. Okay. Flows out, right? You need love? Sure, how much? Quarter cup. Nope. Pours out. Right? He makes our cups, but he gives us more than we need. The God of abundance. Look, surely, with promise, with guarantee, no doubt, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. With promise, without a doubt, God will have goodness and mercy to follow you. Even through the hard stuff, even through the storms, even through the trouble, even through the trial, even in the burnout and the heartbreak and the brokenness, God will follow you there. And with that comes goodness and mercy and peace and joy and love and security, comfort. I mean, all of it. And he'll, as you go along, he's working on you. And what is he giving you? Kindness, compassion, long-suffering, tenderness goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. He's given you all the fruit of the Spirit and so much more. Growing you as you go. But we want to live in the cave. We want to stay where Elijah was, with our arms crossed and our minds turned away from him, living in that emotion just because it's what you're feeling presently. We want to stay in that cave. I want to stay in that cave sometimes. But we can't. Because very simply, it's not good for you. It's not. You know who is good for you? God. And if you're here today and you're saved, you've got him. And if you're here today and you're not saved, you can have him. We'll show you how. All right? We're going to pray. And we'll have an invitation. Our Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for waking us up. And for, again, the opportunity to be in church. God, I pray that you would help us as we think about Elijah. Lord, struggling and in his mind and in his emotions, in the burnout, Lord, as we live sometimes with burnout and as we sometimes get into our our emotions and our thoughts and in our mind, God, would you help us to remember that you know exactly what we're going through and that you care, God. Help us to claim the promises that were mentioned tonight and whatever other stuff that we know. Help us to think on you, Lord, to follow that still, small voice. In your name I pray, amen.
If God spoke to you tonight, why don't you come to this altar? Come talk to the Lord. A message like that, surely that was for somebody here, probably many of us.